Proverbs chapter number 21. I'm going to read one verse this morning. Verse number 3. The Bible says, To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. One more time. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Now this phrase, more acceptable than sacrifice, or elsewhere it's written greater than sacrifice, okay, very rare thing in the Bible. I don't know what it is about the world that thinks all God wants is for you to give Him things. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. God's not interested in what you have, right? God is interested in your heart, what's in your heart. Right? He's not opposed to service. We talked about that last week. How important service is. About how being a faithful servant right, is the greatest thing that can be said of any Christian. Is that you were called faithful. Okay? But, service and sacrifice are two different things. Service is something that you are called to do. Okay? You do not get to decide to serve somebody else. They have to invite you to become a servant. Okay? Christ bought you with his blood, but instead of calling you a slave, or instead of calling himself your master, he called you his friend. He made you a joint heir to his throne. You are his family. Right? And out of love, he asks you to submit yourself to service. He does not command you to do it. Right? God could put chains on all of us and force us to do anything that he desired to do. But he made man a free moral agent. He invites you to be of service to the master. Okay, but sacrifice, everybody thinks that sacrifice is what being a Christian is about. No, being a Christian really is about giving up a, you know, things that really don't matter all that much. Things that aren't a part of you now because they're a part of the old man. You know how easy it is to give up something that you don't desire anymore? That, by definition, is not sacrifice. That's just God changing you. Right? But from the world's perspective, well, I've got to give this up and give that up and give this up. Right? Wink at their ignorance. Right? They have, their eyes are blinded. Okay? They have no understanding. But sacrifice, in truth is about taking of what belongs to you. Tithe is not a sacrifice. The tithe belongs to God. Right? We understand that. Sacrifice is taking something that God gave to you and giving it back to Him. Okay, it is about taking from the 90% that God said that you could have to live off of and by faith giving it back to God and believing that God, one, deserves what you gave Him. Okay, he owned it anyway. He just let you borrow it for a little bit. Okay, but two, out of reverence, you by faith say that God, you mean so much to me, you mean more than this does. And by faith, I believe you're just going to take care of me. Okay, well, sacrifice in the Old Testament was done for various reasons. Right? There was a praise offering. Okay, you are offering it. What's that mean? It don't belong to you anymore. You're giving it to God. Okay, that's a sacrifice. You're going without in order to give something to God to show your appreciation. Okay? There's a praise offering. Okay, there was the offering for sin. There was an offering for uncleanliness. Okay, there was an offering for many things under the law that if you didn't offer that or if you didn't take that sacrifice to the priest and allow them to offer it upon the burnt altar that in the eyes of God, right, you were outside. You couldn't come in. You didn't belong because you were unclean. Okay, well, sacrifices in the Old Testament also. Okay, you see, they were always a sign of obedience. Well, if we were to go and look at the life of the King Saul... There came a day that the man of God showed up and said, Saul, why didn't you follow God's commandments? Why didn't you follow His instructions? 
And Saul said, oh, well, we were going to take all the things that we didn't do, and we were going to offer them up to God as a sacrifice. And the man of God, under the unction of God, looked at the king and said, obedience is greater than sacrifice. Right? Sacrifice was all about being obedient. You offered the sacrifice out of obedience because it pained you to know that you had violated the law of God. You know when you offer sacrifice, when originally you were trying to be right with God all along. You were doing your best to be obedient before you found out that you had messed up and you wanted to get it made right. But knowingly committing a sin with the intention of trying to cover it up with sacrifice, that eh, doesn't accomplish very much. God values what? Obedience. You know what another word for obedience is? We talked about it a lot last week. Faithfulness. Okay, well this week, it says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Well, if God accepted your sacrifice, depending on which kind it was, okay, let's look at the day that they dedicated the temple, Solomon's temple. When God accepted everything that they had done and the labor and the sacrifice and the praise and the worship that had been going on, and Solomon prayed, dedicating the house to God, God found it acceptable. You know what he did? He filled the house with a smoke to signify his presence. And the smoke was so thick that the very priests were driven out of the temple. They couldn't do their job, which was to tend and to make sure that the house of God was in, by every detail, perfect order. That nothing went awry. And God said, you don't have to take care of my house for a little bit. I'm moving in. Right? His presence was made manifest among His people. Do you know what the reward of obedience is? Or do you know what the reward for sacrifices in the Old Testament were? It was the presence of God among God's people. Amen. They did not commit sacrifices because they feared God. They kept their sacrifices and they strove to be obedient. Why? So that God would dwell among His people. When Israel stopped being concerned about what it was that God found acceptable and unacceptable, that's when the presence of God would depart from Israel. That's where their hearts would become hard again and they would worship after false gods. Right? Obedience, sacrifice, and this one, justice and judgment. The reason that we add those things to our lives are not because we are seeking to get a gift from God, it's because we desire God Himself. We understand that in order to get closer to God, we got to change. Right? He's working on us, He's made us into that new creature. Right? I'll remind you, okay, if any man be in Christ, He is a new creature. He made you completely into something new when you got saved. There's nothing lacking. Right? You're not waiting on a part to come down with him when he meets us in the clouds in the rapture, or if you go through the, went to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, he's not going to give you a missing puzzle piece. You're as saved today as you're ever going to be if you're saved. You're not missing anything. You are a new creature. One of the testaments of that is the latter part of that verse. Old things pass away. That is a present tense. Old things pass away. Meaning they're in the process of falling off. There's some things I won't get rid of on this side of glory until I either go through the grave or I go through the rapture, like this flesh. Trust me, you don't want to see me without skin. Okay? That'd be creepy. But in all seriousness, the flesh, that spiritual side of us, the old man, I have to carry it with me because I was born with it. Just because I've been born again spiritually does not mean that I get to shirk my responsibilities for what I came into this world as. I've said it many times. That's why he said, take up your cross and follow me. That cross is for you to nail your own flesh to every day. To crucify the old man. That's why Paul said he died daily. 
He had to wake up and put more nails in that flesh because he knew if he lapsed or, lapsed, or if he lacked in anything that the flesh was liable to jump off of the cross and cause some problems. That is our struggle. Jesus used the cross once. You know where he left it? The same place they dropped it. He didn't say, take up my cross and follow me. He used his cross, and it was finished. Amen. He didn't say, all right, in three days I'll be back and leave the cross because I'm taking it with me. No, it served its purpose. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Why? Because I need it daily. I haven't attained to what he is yet. Okay? But through obedience, what do we do? Old things pass away. They may still be a part of us, but they begin to die off. Okay? You don't spray weed killer and then two seconds later the weed's dead. Okay? It's got to get down to the roots. It's got to work. The Word has to work in your heart and in your life. The Spirit of God has to mold and make you and fashion you into what God would have you be. You are a new creature. He's just knocking rough edges off. They will pass away. And behold, meaning take a look, all things become new. Right? One of these days, everything's going to be new. It's going to be perfect. But even in the life of a Christian here, you could spiritually see they may look the same on the outside they may get some more wrinkles may have some more gray hairs right may have a few more you know what's the word I'm looking for here sunspots anything else, right they may age but inwardly they are always new right test the blessings of God and see if as the Bible says every day they aren't new God doesn't deal with expired or day old or, you know, this has been sitting on the shelf for a while, I'll give it to you at a discount. That's not how God works. Every day, yes. they are renewed. Why? Because He wants you, all things, to become new. How can you make something new with old stuff? You can't. That's why God has to take new things and add them to us to make us into something new. Okay, well, anyway, back to our verse. But we're talking about things that are more acceptable than sacrifice. God sees sacrifice as what? An invitation from His people to intercede or to act on their behalf. Sacrifice is an open admission. Lord, I'm wrong and you're right. Lord, I'm not enough, but you are. Sacrifice was something that was publicly done, but it could also be privately done. Even if nobody else is around you, you can tell when there's a sacrifice going on. You tell me, go read the book of Job. It said he offered up burnt sacrifices every day for his house and for the houses of all of his children in case by chance they just happened to forget. You know how long it takes to completely consume a burnt sacrifice upon an altar? It takes time. Right? We get impatient and we throw a piece of meat onto the grill. We just get impatient for it to be cooked, let alone completely consumed. Right? While you're tending to make sure the fowls of the air don't come and land on it and defile it and spoil the sacrifice. Job spent a good portion of his day every day up on the hill at the altar sacrificing unto God. I don't know how much of his day, but I can tell you this, it takes a while to offer up all those offerings and all those sacrifices and to be present and to be attentive to the sacrifice to make sure that it's done according to the will of God you know what all of that said outwardly right if you're burning that big of a bonfire and there's smoke going up and you've got the smell of you know consumed meat that travels a bit you know what everybody around Job said? Job's pretty serious about God being in his life. You know why Job, or why Job offered those sacrifices unto God? He did it because he valued God more than anything that God had blessed him with. That's what the entire book of Job is about. The devil doubted that if God took everything away from Job, that Job would still love God. And God said, you don't know his heart. So the devil was allowed to take everything Eventually, all the way down to his life. He was allowed to corrupt the very flesh of his body, but he couldn't touch his life. 
And, and many times in all of this, Job never sinned against God. You know why? Because long before he was ever tested, he had already committed those things to his life. Because he valued the presence of God more than anything else. You want proof? Go read it. Job says, my greatest fear has come upon me. You know what his greatest fear was? He looked to his left, he looked to his right, he looked in front of him, and he looked behind him, and he could not perceive God. The biggest fear in Job's life is that God would not be a part of it. Openly. To where he could see it, and other people could see it. The princes of the kingdom came down and talked to Job when they needed advice. You know what that means? People knew that God's hand was on Job. If Job says to do it, that means it's pretty much the same thing as God saying to do it. Because Job wouldn't say it unless he thought that it was right with God. You know what all those sacrifices were a testament of? Job wanted the presence of God. But right? sacrifice is a very important thing in the Old Testament. Because without it, God could not be satisfied under the law. Sacrifice was necessary. Nowadays, the sacrifice for sin has already been paid. But still, people think that by cutting things out of their life or by offering things up unto God and saying, Lord, I'd rather, you know, making barters with God. That's not how God works. Well, Lord, if I give this up, can I go and do this? That's not how God works. In the New Testament, sacrifice is a form of submission. Yes, many times people would go and they'd sell off everything that they owned and they'd give it to God. They didn't do that because God commanded them to. They did that because by doing so, they were committing themselves 100% of the time to be a part of the ministry of God. Why'd they sell everything they owned and give it to the church? Because they'd rather have all God than everything else that they had in the world. It was a testament that they didn't want to go a moment with anything else in their life interfering with what God would have them to do. Why? Because they valued the presence of God. You know why Saul disobeyed God? Saul didn't value the presence of God. When Saul was little in his own eyes, it was used greatly by God because he relied upon God. He had faith in God. When Saul got too big for his britches, he thought that he could control the situation. And he found out very quickly he could not. He did not value God's presence because he stopped relying upon God. Sacrifice throughout the entire Bible is an outward, open statement. As one songwriter wrote, that I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. Right? I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Why? Because His presence is, as the Song of Solomon wrote, right, sweeter than the honeycomb. Amen. What's He smell like? He smells like cedars. He smells like fine perfumes. Long before He even gets here, I'm already happy because when He shows up, the situation changes. Right, where do I find them? I find them down among the lilies. Amen. Right, it's in a place that's hidden away. That's what lilies for deer are a representation of, concealment. Why? Because they smell enough to what? Get the dogs off of your back. They'll cover your scent. They're tall enough to what? Hide you. And if they're thick enough, they're hard to get through. The world's not used to walking through the lilies. You know what it does? It prevents them to getting to where you are. Sacrifice, in its truest form, is saying, Lord, if this is what has come between you and me, I'd rather it be gone and still have you. Now, whether that means offering up upon an altar, whether that means just being obedient, whether that means submission of self to a uh, call that God's put on your life, that's always better than sacrifice in obedience. But here we find justice and judgment. Well, those are, those are two different things. 
It says to do justice and judgment. Again, exercising judgment and using justice, you have to do them. They are not things that you can have and not use. Okay? You can have a car, but if you never drive it, it's a waste to you. In fact, in the modern day world that we live in, you got to pay taxes on it whether you drive it or you don't drive it. Just owning it, you're losing something unless you use it to where it's a benefit unto you. Okay, you may never have to change the oil or put gas in it if you don't drive it, but it's not adding anything to your life. The same is true of justice and judgment. You have to do it. And you know what to do means? It means that you're exercising obedience. You're being obedient to do what God has said. Justice has a synonym. They often are used to define each other. It's called equity. You know what equity means? You treat everybody as they deserve to be treated. Well, what is justice? It means that you mete out judgment as it is deserved. True justice is ignorant to race, gender, age, position, right? How wealthy they are, when it was done, when it wasn't done, right? What was their intention behind it? No. True justice, okay, throws all of the variables out the window and looks at what was done. What did you do? And what is the just reward for what you did? You know what God's justice is? Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know who determines what you get in the future? You do. You reap what you sow. That's part of God's judgment, is justice. But see, justice truly is peeling away all the things that are meant or people try to throw up as distractions, seeing things for what they are and doing rightly according to the law. Now what law? Well, nowadays we're talking about courthouses laws, statutes, okay, legislation. Well, what's it talking about in this verse? It's not just talking about doing justice to other people. It's talking about doing justice to yourself exercising judgment on yourself did not Jesus say that we ought to be careful with what measuring stick we judge other people because whatever judgment we mete out will be meted unto us you know how you'll be judged however you judge yourself however you judge others well if I judge others and myself to the same standard I don't have anything to worry about I'm not a hypocrite. But see, you can judge without exercising judgment. It says to do judgment. It doesn't say to judge. In fact, Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. It says to do judgment. You know, that means you are the arm or the mechanism of judgment. You didn't decide what was right and wrong but you're going to make sure that things are done right. And that if something is done wrong, that it is corrected. You are an instrument of judgment. What's that mean, Brother Jordan? It means that you accept what God has judged as right and wrong, and you go about implementing it in your life. To do judgment. You know who judges? God judges. In fact, the Bible says that all judgment has been committed unto Christ. You know who has say over what is right and what is wrong? God does. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to wrestle with whether or not something is or is not holy. He's already defined it. And then on top of it, He gives me a helper known as the Holy Ghost to be my guide, to illuminate the Scriptures, right? to bring all understand why so that I may walk in the judgments of God uprightly that I will know which path to take and when I have question what can I do I can ask him 
And through spiritual discernment, I'll never have to worry about not knowing what God finds approval with. Because I trust Him to help me when I don't know, when I forget. To do judgment is better than sacrifice. It says to do justice. Justice is what a person deserves. It means to look at what was done and what needs to be done to correct the situation. Justice is not, well, you poked me, so I'm going to hit you with a baseball bat. That is not justice. Justice is about finding the proper thing that needs to be done to make up for what was initially done. If you run over a flower box accidentally, you know what your what justice is? Either you go back and you fix it, you plant new flowers exactly like the old ones, or if you're unable to do that, you pay the amount of money for them to have it fixed. No more, no less. That's justice. You know what isn't justice? Well, you ran over my flower box, so give me the keys to your car. I own it now. That must have been a very expensive flower box. Right? Well, last time you went down to Lowe's, the flowers cost $20. Now you're saying that they cost twenty grand. I don't think that's justice. Justice is about the proper payment for whatever was done. Whether that's a reward or whether it's a punishment, it is done according and in balance with what was done. It says to do justice. You know what that means? You give people what they essentially need. Justice is not always about ruining somebody else's life because of a decision that they made. It's about correcting that decision. It may be right, okay, under the letter of the law, to throw somebody away and let them rot in jail for the rest of their life. But justice is about what's best, not just for them, for the community. What do you think is better? One more grave in a cemetery or somebody that has been rehabilitated that can go out and add something to society? That's what used to be the point of punishment, was to correct an action. To correct, or to correct the character of a certain individual. The punishment must meet the crime. But what do you think God in heaven would say to, well, Lord, they deserve to be thrown into hell. Yeah, but they might get saved, and they might add value to the kingdom of heaven. Do you give them what they deserve, or do you give them what they need? Amen. The prodigal son deserved a stoning. You know what the father gave him? A robe, a ring, shoes on his feet, and he fell on top of him. He gave him what he needed, what? To once again become a productive member of the family. He told the oldest son, when the oldest son began to open his heart and uh, utter his complaints unto the father, and he said, your brother who once was dead is now alive. He said, he was lost as soon as he left the house. He was dead to us. He said, but now you have a brother again. He says, I have two sons again. Amen. Do you think it's better for him to stay dead? Or do you think it's better for him to become alive? To where he can become productive again. Where he can add value to our family. Justice is not about what people deserve. It's about what people need. Not just the person who did it, the people around them. Now, I've said all that to say this. To do justice and judgment. You know what you have to do in order to truly be just to other people? You have to tell them where they can get help. I cannot help anyone in and of myself. Everything that I am is by the grace of God and because God made me that way. 
Everything that I do, it's because God gave me the ability to have one more breath and one more day on this earth. And if we're being honest, unless I do it by His guidance and His instruction, I'm doing it in vain anyway. So that means that God told me to go and do it, or else I wouldn't have done it. It is justice that when I tell somebody, instead of telling them all the ways that they're wrong, the judge doesn't get up and tell you why you're guilty. The jury does that. The jury decides whether or not you're guilty. The judge is the one who issues the payment, right? The verdict, what it's going to take to get things made right. People know that they're guilty long before they ever step before God. People know that they're wrong. That's why so many people are looking for something to make up that hole in their life because they know that something's not right. They don't need to be told all the ways that they're guilty. You know what they need to be told? They need to be told what they need. Justice is not about condemning other people. Justice is about telling people how they can be helped. That used to be what courthouses were about. People would submit themselves to judgment from a judge, from a king, from whoever it was. They would say, I want to get things made right. You know what they wanted? They wanted things to go back to the way that they were before. Well, you can't do that if there's a problem that's been un unaddressed, that's been left out in the open. You know why we couldn't have a relationship with God? Because there was this problem called sin out in the open. God issued judgment toward us. You know what His judgment was? That before you'd be cast off into hell, that He'd send His Son. That He'd send somebody along your way to tell you about His Son. That He would take care of all the payments and all the fines and everything that should have been levied against you why? So that you could become alive. You walked into court a dead man and walked out the son of a king. What did he give you? He gave you what you needed. When justice means more and when judgment means more to people than petty vengeance or the idea of being right versus somebody else being wrong, that's not what justice and judgment is about. Justice and judgment is about getting things restored. Returned to what they were once. Now I understand sometimes that's not possible. But I will remind you that after the first murder ever, God did not take the life of Cain. Nowadays we'd want what? Capital punishment. I don't find anywhere that after Cain killed Abel, that Cain was excluded from repentance, where he couldn't make the proper sacrifice to get things made right. You know what drove Cain out? Cain's heart drove Cain out. God didn't drive Cain out. Adam didn't drive... Cain couldn't live with what he did. He thought that he couldn't be forgiven. You know what he never asked for? He never asked for judgment or justice. When you come to an altar and you say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner, you know what you're saying? You're saying, Lord, judge me. Lord, I know I'm wrong, but give me your judgment. You know what God's judgment for sin is? It was Jesus. That was God's justice. He did for you what you could not do for yourself so that you wouldn't have to pay the price of sin. You know what God's answer is? For when people hurt you, it's forgiveness. That's judgment. That's justice in the eyes of God. He told Peter to forgive 70 times 7. He said, if they come and they ask you for forgiveness, you forgive them, Peter. However many times it takes. Because it's better to have somebody in your life that you value than somebody that's dead to you because they did you know, ill against you says they came back and repented of it that they wanted forgiveness he says give it to them you know what the answer from God's word to people that hate you you're supposed to love your enemy 
You say, well, Brother Jordan, that doesn't sound like justice. Not to your flesh, because your flesh is worried about revenge. Your flesh is worried about hurt. And your flesh is worried about the perceived idea that somebody else did something to you. Well, I did a whole lot to Christ, and He didn't hold it against me. Amen. Not for our own glory, but because we want to be accepted by... What do we want? We want His presence. Amen. You want a surefire way for the presence of God to disappear? Right? The commentary that justice and judgment is more acceptable than sacrifice. You know what he's saying? They were still concerned about the sacrifice, but he's saying there's something a whole lot more important to God that y'all are missing. You say that you want the presence of God, but you've forgotten justice and judgment. You want a surefire recipe for God to leave the camp, to stamp Ichabod above the door? Stop being concerned with justice. Judgment. Justice, if somebody's already paid the price before they get to the court, you know what justice is? They dismiss it. They don't make the person go through all the rigmarole of a trial and everything else. If they say, I paid the fine, then it goes away. If you get a speeding ticket, you don't have to show up to court. You can just pay the ticket and you'll be fine. Now you get enough of them, they might take your license away, but if you pay the fine, you're saying, I did it and I want to make things right. Well, when you pay it, you know what happens? It goes away because things were made right. When we come into the house of God, truly, if we want God to show up, if we judge ourselves and we do justice, you know what God deserves? Our best. God didn't define a value with best. He just wants best. He knows that your best and somebody else's best are different. That's why he didn't say you had to meet a certain standard. He just said best. Because you know what God gave? His best. His only begotten Son. It is just that when we come to the house of God, if we desire to see Him, if we desire to hear from Him, if we desire for Him to show up, to manifest His presence, you know what we ought to expect to give our best because that's what God gave for you that's justice you know what it says when somebody walks in and they're not in their best they haven't done their best all week they haven't given their best to study or to prayer or to meditation upon the things of God you know what that does when that person walks into the house of God don't care what they look like on the outside but you know what that says that says that they don't care about the presence of God they're thumbing their nose up to God and say, I can live however I want to and show up at the house of God and everything be okay. That's not justice. God didn't just send anybody. And God didn't say that He would do part of what was required for your salvation. No, He took care of it all. Amen. And you know what He asked in return? That you do what you can. Yes. It is just... That where much is forgiven, much is required. Doesn't say what is required. That's between you and God. But where much is forgiven, there should be much appreciation. There should be much gratitude. That's just. God gave you what you needed instead of what you deserve. There ought to be admiration there. There ought to be love there. There ought to be commitment there. Those are just things. But it's also just that Christians don't walk around with their head down in the mully grubs all the time. You are of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. God sees you as one of the very sons, one of the children of God. He's got a place reserved for you at the family dining table in heaven, at the marriage supper. Right? He's got a place reserved for you in heaven at your own mansion. And you know where it is? It's in His house. You know what that means? You're part of the family. All I'm saying is it's just. Now, I know that people have bad days. But if you walk around defeated all the time, in the eyes of God, that's not just. If the Son sets you free, what are you? Free. You're not in bondage again. You're not under subjection anymore. 
Show me in the early church where they walked around trying not to offend anybody. No, if somebody asked them a question, they told them the truth. Why? Because they wanted to give them what they needed, not what they wanted. They were trying to do justice. And when they were called to stand before trials and whether they were convicted or not, brought before councils and told never to speak in the name of Jesus again, you know what they did? They told them the truth. They told them exactly what they said. Didn't lie about it. In fact, just gave a different accounting of it. Said, here's exactly what happened. Listen up. And then when they'd say, don't go preach, don't speak the name of Jesus again, you know what they'd do? About the time that they stepped out of that courthouse, they'd tell everybody what Jesus did for them to walk out of there and not be hung. Amen. Some of them thought that it was justice and judgment, like St. Andrew or Peter, that they would not be crucified on a cross that hung the same way that Jesus did. They didn't feel worthy. So they'd ask to be crucified at angles or upside down or laying flat on the ground. Because they said, we're not worthy to, be, to die the same death that Jesus did. That was the kind of justice that they exercised. But yeah, nowadays we're worried about who said what and whose feelings were hurt. and Hogwash. How about you do justice? How about you make your life, in personal judgment, the most that it could be to the kingdom of heaven? I promise you this, if that's what your goal is, a whole lot of other things are going to sort themselves out along the way. If what you're worried about is being the most valuable to the master, that you judge yourself as worthy of the call that he put on your life, that you're going to do all that you can to possess it and then go and do it. That's your main concern. Other things are going to find their own perspective, the correct focus in your life. Other things won't deter you. We'll go back to one of the examples I gave before. You know why people sold everything and gave all to the church? Because that's what Jesus was worth to them. They said, Lord, it don't matter if I live a week or a month. I'd rather have all of you than anything that this world has. I'd rather have your presence for a day than a lifetime of luxury down here. They said, I'd rather be counted among the martyrs than someone that lives even just an average life. They may not have been wealthy. They may not have had all. They may have had wants and desires, but they still went and sold everything and said, Lord, I'm all yours. Because Christ did for me what nobody else could, and I want to go be used to tell them about the one that can do for them what was done for me. They judged that that was the right thing to do. They said, Christ left his home, I'll sell my home. They said, Christ left heaven, became a missionary. They said, Lord, send us wherever you want us to be sent. Y'all get angry about three church services a week. They were meeting daily in houses and breaking bread. You know what they judged? I'd rather be all in for God for the amount of time that I have left, whether it was a lifetime or whether it was a few weeks. They said, I'd rather be all in than even have a moment where I doubted whether or not I, instead of letting the Lord be my master, I became a servant to mammon again. That's what they judged was justice. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.